Uh, welcome to LAMPcast, which is made possible by legacy funding from the Five Wings Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Today's lecture, which is called Supporting the Arts, is connected to the Lakes Area Music Festival's Spring Strings Concert, which is going to take place on August 7th and 8th. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our LAMPcast host, and uh, artistic advisor of the Lakes Ferry Music Festival, Garrett McQueen. Thanks, Garrett. Hello, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm very excited to be with you here today. For folks who don't know me, again, my name is Garrett McQueen. I am a bassoonist uh, by training. Uh, these days, I uh, create digital and broadcast media, usually at the intersection of race and Western classical music, but uh, all of my years of uh, radio experience and teaching and other sorts of uh, presenting uh, lend, lend themselves, those, those experiences, lend themselves to presentations um, like these. So I'm really glad to uh, be here. Huge thanks once again to Taylor and Scott for having me for this LAMP cast. I'll go ahead and share my screen here and we will get the presentation started. So the title of this presentation is Spring Strings, Supporting the Arts. This concert that's uh, taken place on August 7th and 8th highlights the beauty of strings, the way they uh, blend and uh, meld together in a really light, warm, exciting, and sometimes even folksy way, as you'll hear in this program that we're going to talk about a bit today. Uh, when I looked at this program, uh, I wanted to go a little bit deeper than just celebrating strings or the sound of spring. Uh, one of the things I found really interesting was that each composer on this program had a unique relationship with financial support, being supported by individuals, uh, organizations, in some cases even government bodies. So that's some of the things that uh, we're going to look at today. We're going to look at how the composers on this program uh, dealt with the issue of support, how it impacted their music and ultimately their legacies as composers. We're going to listen to a little bit of each of the compositions on the program, uh, learn about the composers themselves, and even learn about uh, some folks who were on the peripheral of the, of the story and the uh, careers of these composers. One thing that is really important to remember before I even name these composers is that we tend to think historically of these folks as only composers, but in actuality, these folks had portfolio style careers. They were entrepreneurs who were making a living, making ends meet in many different ways. They weren't just composers, usually musicians first and then composers and then entrepreneurs, teachers and, and, uh, and other folks who have uh, helped uh, keep the, the music rolling over all these years, so to speak. Uh, the composers we'll talk about today um, are Peter Tchaikovsky, Edvard Grieg, and a composer who I was uh, really happy to learn about in preparation uh, for this presentation and the, uh, and the concert, uh, a woman from Poland named Grazhnia Basevich. So we're going to be talking about uh, those three folks and a little bit of their music today. But as we go through, I really encourage everyone to really center the fact that, again, these folks weren't just composers. They had real life bills, real life uh, challenges, real life successes that all relied on the support from folks who valued uh, their uh, valued them as artists and valued their art itself as something meaning meaningful and something that is classic to the human experience. So we're starting with Peter Tchaikovsky going in reverse concert order than, uh, that you'll hear on August 7th and 8th. Uh, Peter Tchaikovsky, <laughs> I, I, I picked out uh, an interesting quote. Inspiration is a guest that does not willingly visit the lazy. I, I found that really interesting because with, uh, the more you read about Tchaikovsky, the more you'll see that he really was a go-getter. He wasn't someone who was laying around every day waiting for a commission, waiting for 
someone to give him some money to continue his work. He was uh, very uh, vivacious throughout his career as the uh, stories and uh, hi historical facts tell. He started his training at age five as a pianist, as many folks know, again, centering uh, the uh, start of these composers' lives as musicians before going into composition. His parents actually wanted him to study law. And while he did end up uh, doing some law study, he was always uh, paying attention to music, had one uh, hand on music. And, you know, of course, as uh, history tells, it's music that he focused on and not law, despite his uh, parents' wishes. Me being a musician, a composer, wasn't seen as something uh, <laughs> very notable back in those days, maybe something uh, not very stable. But, um, you know, he, Tchaikovsky, he is uh, similar to many composers in that he didn't follow his parents' wishes in that regard. He studied music under uh, many very acclaimed musicians, most notably under Anton Rubinstein. Rubinstein is very important because he would uh, end up founding the St. Petersburg Conservatory, which would, of course, give the world of classical music, many, 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 many other uh, very important and famous uh, composers. He was one of the greatest composers of Western ballet music to ever live. Personally, in my uh, performance experience, when it comes to the music of Peter Tchaikovsky, we tend to center his symphonies, especially that fourth symphony. But uh, it's always important to note that his ballets have uh, gone on to fame beyond uh, classical music ecosystems. Just about everyone is familiar with Swan Lake um, and, and the Nutcracker. And there's even um, some notoriety surrounding his uh, famous Cinderella ballet as well. One thing that we always talk about and bring up when we uh, discuss Peter Tchaikovsky is that he's noted as one of history's more impactful queer composers. When I give presentations um, at the intersection of race and classical music, I often speak to uh, race not being something arbitrary, how it has an actual impact on the music itself. Well, this also uh, relates to Tchaikovsky uh, when it comes to his sexuality. Uh, back in those days, in the late 19th century, as you know, everyone uh, knows and can imagine, it wasn't very safe for um, a man to be gay, for a man to uh, 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 affirm himself uh, as a member of the queer community. And this came out in the sound of much of his music, especially his Sixth Symphony, if you're familiar with it. Symphonies typically end with loud, fast, bombastic movements. Well, his final symphonic movement is actually very slow and solemn, and it speaks to the, the hardships that um, he uh, faced in that regard, a very important uh, fact to really understand about uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, legacy. And his death, um, as I uh, have been reading these past couple weeks, um, is still rel relatively mysterious. He died of cholera. He, uh, he drank some, um, um, some water that wasn't sanitized, and um, he died uh, sometime later. Some say this was actually um, a death by suicide due in part to um, his struggles during that time with his sexuality and and, and some other things that were going on uh, in his life. So as we move forward, I think that we really have to um, always remember not only his music and his legacy, but uh, the, the very important sacrifices he made living his life um, in the way he wished to back in the late 19th century. Now, the name Peter Tchaikovsky may not be one that we would know if it wasn't for the woman who's pictured on your screen here, a woman named Nadezhda Filaretovna von Meck, or Nadezhda von Meck, as she's uh, often known. Uh, in interesting couple of quotes from her. She was quoted once as saying, I shall tell you that I am an irreconcilable enemy of marriages. I, I included that quote because uh, Nadezhda von Meck in her day was not only a woman with a lot of means, with access to a lot of money, but she really was a mover and shaker in, in many ways, a, a sort of a progressive who really believed in um, the rights of, of women and making sure that um, women had a say uh, in their lives, especially when it comes to uh, marriage. Uh, the second quote I chose from her here, the distribution of rights and obligations as determined by social laws, I find speculative and immoral. And this would really um, uh, come to fruition as it applies to the life of Tchaikovsky later on um, in their relationship, which I'll get to here in a bit. 
Nadezhda von Meck allowed her daughters to choose their husbands, which was, again, very, very um, different for those days. There was even a point to where uh, one of her daughters uh, caught the eye of Claude Debussy and understanding his legacy as a composer and a musician. Um, even back uh, in those days, it would have been the easy choice for many mothers to give away uh, their daughters, but Nadezhda von Meck was uh, different in that regard and actually did not allow um, her daughter uh, to marry the late uh, Claude Debussy. Nadezhda von Meck was a self-proclaimed atheist um, who, you know, fought against even the religious norms of the day. Um, and through all of that, excuse me, she was a lover and supporter of the arts, music in particular. She paid Tchaikovsky a handsome salary after they met, actually about 6,000 rubles a year, which translated today is about $80,000. So it, it wasn't something to, to sleep on. It was, it was very, very um, important to Nadezhda to Fun Mech that the music of many folks, uh, Tchaikovsky uh, specifically, would continue. And uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we may not even know the name, Tchaikovsky if it wasn't for the support that came from the late Nadezhda von Meck. Uh, they actually had a sort of awkward relationship, Meck and Tchaikovsky. Uh, he agreed, Tchaikovsky agreed to um, accept uh, her patronage as long as the two never met. Uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, according to letters uh, that we have uh, between the two, often noted that he wasn't in love with the fact that every one of their correspondences um, had something to do with money. But at the end of the day, um, Tchaikovsky uh, needed that support. So they maintained that relationship for about 13 years, writing letters uh, back and forth with Nadezhda uh, von Meck supporting Tchaikovsky's work uh, financially from a distance. So the composition um, that is on the Spring Strings program for um, later, uh, early next month, is uh, the Souvenir of Florence. This is Tchaikovsky's only string sextet. So around this time in the late uh, 19th century, lots of folks were experimenting with chamber music uh, configurations beyond the traditional string quartet. So Tchaikovsky chose to make a six part composition and it ended up uh, being his only one, but one of his uh, more celebrated works in his entire repertoire, especially if you center in on his chamber music. Tchaikovsky dedicated this piece of music to uh, the St. Petersburg Chamber Music Society. One note about Russian chamber music societies, there were sort of like um, clubs, almost like salons, where uh, composers would get that moral support. They would get the um, attention uh, uh, that they were all searching for from the masses. And, you know, after um, being accepted by the St. Petersburg Chamber Music Society and all of his gratitude, Tchaikovsky uh, decided to write this piece of music music and thanks to them. It was composed in part, as you uh, may be able to, uh, to guess by the title, I'm going to turn my phone off here, sorry, as you, as you may be able to guess by the title, in Italy, uh, he was on um, he was on leave uh, around the year of uh, 1890. And um, he, uh, you know, just wanted to get away. And thanks to, again, the patronage of Nadezhda von Meck, he was able to do that. The entire thing um, wasn't actually composed um, in Florence. Much of it was uh, composed in Russia, but it's titled The Souvenir of Florence, you know, to, to mark that bit of history uh, in Tchaikovsky's like and the history that's connected uh, to this music. Despite its title, uh, the piece of music itself really maintains and celebrates a Russian sound. One of the things that you can read about this piece of music this four movement piece of music is that the first two movements are uh, relatively uh, traditional sounding, especially to the uh, sensibilities of European classical music back in the late 19th century. But as you get um, later on uh, into the movements, especially that uh, last movement, you begin to hear the uh, Russian folk song uh, uh, aesthetic and, and the way that Tchaikovsky uh, and basically all Russian composers always centered nation, always centered identity um, in their pieces of music. And it's uh, an important work as, uh, as it pertains to the relationship between Tchaikovsky and Adesh Devon Mech um, as an important post Mech composition. So uh, as the story goes, uh, Nadezhda von Meck had a son who ended up marrying a niece of Tchaikovsky. 
Tchaikovsky, and that actually began to um, strain the relationship. Tchaikovsky wanted to maintain that separation. He still did not want them to meet, and there was actually pressure for them to meet um, at that wedding, and that sort of began some of Tchaikovsky's um, feelings uh, that became even more awkward and pressures that Nadezhda von Meck was beginning to get from her family to stop supporting Tchaikovsky and instead make sure that um, their inheritance is uh, intact and that the wealth is passed down uh, through the continued uh, generations. Nadezhda von Meck officially broke things off with Tchaikovsky not long after um, this uh, wedding, after uh, that marriage between Tchaikovsky's niece and her son, um, in 1890, uh, a few months before this piece, Souvenir of Florence, was um, written. Uh, in the goodbye, uh, Nadezhda gave Tchaikovsky a full year in advance, uh, which again was about $80,000 if you want to convert that to today's uh, currency after inflation and all those sorts of things. Nadezhda von Meck claimed bankruptcy when she um, cut ties with Tchaikovsky and, uh, and gave him a, a year in advance that final payment. But um, history uh, shows that Nadezhda von Meck was actually being uh, pressured by her own family again, as I mentioned, to secure that money uh, for them. There were quarrels about where the inheritance would go, especially as Nadezhda von Meck started uh, to get older and, and would face um, illnesses. Um, but nonetheless, um, that, that trip to Florence and maybe even many of the pieces that that came after uh, would not have been possible at all without that support from Nadezhda von Meck, no matter how much her family uh, sort of, you know, didn't like her giving their money away. And there were also some uh, public um, implications as well. There were uh, uh, other rich folks, other, other uh, folks of the aristocracy who saw it a little strange that uh, this woman was giving uh, money and support uh, so heavily to Tchaikovsky, especially, again, considering things like his uh, so-called alternative lifestyle, his, his sexuality, and the general feeling that um, composers uh, weren't of the uh, higher class. They were more of servants back then. So there, there's, there was a lot of complications toward the end when it came to their relationship. But um, we, we are all and we all should be grateful for that relationship because it helped make way for so many of Tchaikovsky's compositions. Uh, we're going to listen to a little bit about the uh, first 90 seconds of one of the movements of the Souvenir of Florence. And as you listen to this excerpt in particular, again, think about the idea of Russian folk music, that national Russian sound, a sound that uh, people back in those days would have automatically identified um, as Russian. Think about that as you're listening to this as well, again, um, as the fact that it may not have existed if it weren't for the late Nadezhda von Meck. This performance um, of this excerpt from the Souvenir of Florence features the Manhattan Chamber Players. <laughs>
something that I was thinking about um, as I chose that excerpt. If you uh, paid attention there toward the end, you heard that. Tchaikovsky was known for borrowing from himself. So I mentioned uh, ballet earlier. That's a melody that um, you can hear quite prominently in um, Swan Lake. So uh, again, just another example of there about how Tchaikovsky was always centering that Russian sensibility, even his own sensibility as a composer. Another thing that I think it's important to note about this composition is that when we talk about the traditional string quartet, um, the first violin is often leading the charge, even musically when it comes to the actual melodies. Well, as you could hear there in that sextet, it's not only the uh, first violin, the principal violin who gets to shine. There are multiple viola moments, um, second violin, and even the cellos get uh, plenty of time to shine uh, in this composition by Peter Tchaikovsky. So I'm looking forward to your, to your being able to um, enjoy the entire composition. Again, a multi -move Movement, four movement work, um, usually about uh, 27 or 28 minutes uh, in, in full performance, a work that we may not have if it weren't for the support of Nadezhda von Meck. So I hope you enjoy that performance when we get to it early next month. So that piece of music will actually close the concert. Uh, the piece of music in the middle um, of the three uh, compositions for that concert is one by the late great Edward Grieg. Edward Grieg is not only one of Western classical music's most famous figures, but he's still hailed as the most famous person from Bergen in his um, home country of Norway. There are many, many dozens of statues, one of which um, depicted there uh, of the late Edward Grieg still standing to this day, um, in addition to um, concert halls and even um, a couple of schools. Edward Grieg helped codify Norway's classical voice on a global scale. So as we uh, were getting toward the end of the um, 19th century and creeping into the uh, 20th century, the idea of codifying a national voice in this art form was becoming more and more popular globally. If you joined uh, me here last week, you may uh, remember that I uh, spoke about uh, Antony Dvorak and um, his relationship with um, codifying um, an American sound. Um, with, with the help again of a of a woman named Jeanette Thurber, her support. So um, th this was happening all over the globe. Folks were really looking to Russia as uh, a great example of what that looked like musically. Um, again, uh, in the music of Tchaikovsky, um, most famously by a group of composers known as the Mighty Handful or the Five. Well, um, Edward Grieg um, led the way in many ways in doing that for Norway in the same way, again, as Dvorak did for the United States, as uh, Jean Sibelius did, um, for uh, example, in, in Finland. And eventually, uh, folks like William Grant Still and Florence Price, who codified uh, the Afro-American sound. So very important to note um, Grieg's role in, again, codifying that Norwegian sound on a global stage. Uh, Edward Grieg actually met uh, Peter Tchaikovsky in 1888, and they both had lots of mutual respect for one another. Grieg had, of course, heard of Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky um, was just learning about Edward Grieg, and um, in the accounts that uh, we have uh, from that meeting, they both uh, highly respected each other and each other's music. The last thing that Edward Grieg said um, was, well, if it must be so, he passed away in 1907 um, after a very succe uh, successful career, um, after a very successful latter years um, of his life. And uh, he impacted the Western classical genre significantly with many works, including his uh, famous Peer Gint, the incidental music he wrote for a play called Peer Gint. There are actually two suites. We're used to hearing, uh, I believe, the first of those suites, which ends with uh, In the Hall of the Mountain King. But if you're ever looking to dive a little deeper into Edward Grieg, I would encourage you to check out his Peer Gint suite number two. Again, music taken from uh, a score of incidental music that he wrote for a play, um, also titled Pierre Gant. Support for the individual um, often manifests as support for 
the arts. Um, a, uh, a quote again here from Grieg is, I must admit that I left the Leipzig Conservatory just as stupid as I entered it. Naturally, I did learn something there, but my individuality was still a closed book to me. I, I chose that quote to bring in because from the very beginning, Edward Grieg had the spirit and the attitude of an artist, someone who, who didn't believe in really coloring within the lines, being within the box. And that attitude, that creativity would actually uh, lead to Grieg um, earning broad, broad, broad support from not only individuals, but um, even his very government. He had his solo debut uh, shortly before graduating from the Leipzig Conservatory in um, 1861. And in this performance, he not only showcased his ability to move the genre forward, but he honored the greats. That concert famously included works by Beethoven. Um, Grieg's composition um, career became more um, important, a more important part of his portfolio beginning around the 1870s. After um, leaving school, he traveled as a uh, solo pianist and much of the money that he earned um, that gave him the ability to write music came from uh, those days, came from those uh, touring concerts. He maintained a solo and orchestral career um, through all of those years, uh, which led him all the way to Windsor Castle in the year of 1897. I believe it was Queen Victoria's court um, for whom uh, he and his wife performed uh, back in the late 19th century. Grieg earned a government pension um, from uh, from his, uh, from his home country of Norway. Um, he received honorary doctorate degrees from multiple Norwegian institutions. And he even uh, created a few recordings uh, in the early 20th century, recordings that actually uh, still exist in CD and now uh, digital form. So uh, not only um, the support manifesting um, into Grieg's really uh, pumping music into the classical repertoire, but also uh, helping form the beginnings of the tradition of recording this Western classical music and making sure that it's available uh, virtually forever for the future generations to enjoy. And um, his home, known as Trollaugen, um, is a national monument to this day. And there are a couple of, of photos of um, the, the home of the late Grieg um, and his wife. Again, um, accolades and uh, physical material things that would not have been possible at all if it wasn't for the type of support that he received. So unlike Tchaikovsky, it wasn't so much um, individual support from uh, one rich patron, but it was uh, Grieg's uh, portfolio style career and his dedication to being his own artist, his own musician that really earned him that uh, broad appeal in an, in an official way, all the way up to receiving a government pension as a composer of Norwegian classical music. So the piece of music that um, is on the concert on this August 7th and 8th concert by Edward Grieg, um, it actually comes from a slightly larger work called Two Elegiac Melodies. So uh, these two pieces, uh, the arrangements of these two pieces rather, were completed in 1880 and they were published the following year in 1881. Now these two movements um, that make up uh, this larger piece is actually the instrumental arrangement of 12 melodies this is Opus 33 that honors Norwegian songs and uh, culture uh, with lyrics to those songs uh, written by uh, the uh, poet there, uh, Mr. Binya. I, uh, I think it's important to note, uh, again, this uh, Norwegian song um, foundation of this piece of music, because again, as I mentioned, that idea of codifying a national sound was becoming more and more popular um, in those days. And understanding uh, Grieg's respect and love for Tchaikovsky, for example, and the way that he always honored home was something that uh, Grieg did in his own way by writing those 12 songs. They were originally for voice and piano with uh, the two elegiac melodies uh, uh, arranged for um, strings arranged for orchestra uh, coming later.
The first of those two melodies, those two songs, is titled The Wounded Heart, and it's been described as wounds have been suffered by the heart in the struggles of life, but it has survived. Faith is not destroyed. So it's definitely not a downtrodden song, but it's a song that um, is filled with uh, those struggles and that resilience. Uh, the uh, Of the two um, melodies, uh, the one on the concert is actually the second of them. It's subtitled titled Last Spring. Uh, this song um, was originally meant to highlight the beauty of the countryside in spring, appearing after the snow of winter. Um, Vinya thinks uh, he might be seeing it for the last time. He thought he might be seeing it for the last time when he wrote those lyrics. Uh, this wouldn't really have been something that I could understand conceptually as a Southerner, but, you know, those of us who are um, here in Minnesota can definitely speak to finally coming to spring after those long winters. And I think that's a, a really great way to uh, make a, a local uh, connection with this piece of music as you're listening to it. You know, on a, um, on a very uh, personal note, uh, this, uh, the second of these two melodies last spring um, is a tune that I used to listen to all the time as a very young musician that I would try to recreate uh, on my own instruments. That's the case for many beginners. So Edward Grieg, not only codifying a Norwegian Norwegian sound and uh, pumping some really important and very famous music into the broader classical repertoire, but even um, in death, having a role in the way musicians begin their journeys as classical musicians, music uh, that would not exist, at least uh, in the way that it does today, if it weren't for that support specifically from the Norwegian government. So we're going to listen to about the first 90 seconds of last spring. This performance features the Taiwan Connection. Thank you. Yeah, one of the words that comes to mind as I listen uh, to that piece of music, even that excerpt there, is the word hope. Again, there are so many folks who may not be able to <laughs> really understand in a real way spring finally breaking after months of cold and, and months of snow. But even without that physical um, understanding of what Grieg was referring to there musically as it applied to uh, cold and snowy Norway, I think the idea of uh, resilience and just um, uh, perseverance even uh, fighting through is uh, such an important important theme of that uh, piece of music. Again, Last Spring <clears throat> will be the composition that's performed on the concert, but I also encourage everyone to take a listen to The Wounded Heart um, from those two elegiac melodies. It, it just really 
um, offers a perspective um, that's really personal, um, not only, you know, geographic, that, that nationalism that Grieg pushed through his music, but just sort of the spirit of the person, the, the human spirit, and uh, passing through those difficult times to warmer uh, times in, in, in more ways than one, literally and figuratively there. So I'm looking forward uh, to each and every one of you getting to enjoy a live performance of Last Spring by the late, great Edward Grieg. So the final composer that I'm going to talk about on this uh, presentation, but the first composer you'll hear from um, on August 7th and 8th is a Polish composer by the name of Grzegina Baczewicz, a very um, important woman composer. And again, a composer that I was really grateful to get to learn more about uh, in conjunction uh, with this uh, presentation and concert early uh, next month. So um, Ms. Baczewicz was born back in 19... 1909 and began her formal studies in music in 1928. So a more uh, contemporary composer um, than Tchaikovsky and Grieg, but a composer um, whose uh, story of uh, support um, matches theirs in, in many ways. Um, after um, leaving school, after graduating from school, Grzegnia became the principal violinist of the Polish Radio Symphony. That was in 1936. So earlier, in this presentation, I spoke a little bit about the portfolio style career, how we often think of these composers as only composers, but how often they were uh, musicians first and then composers and then other things like teachers and other sorts of um, entrepreneurs. So this was very pronounced when it comes to uh, Grazina Baczewicz, uh, a woman who began her professional career as a uh, performing musician, as a violinist. <clears throat> because of the time uh, that she lived, uh, this part of the 20th century, and especially in Europe, uh, as you can you know, obviously imagine, uh, World War II paid a uh, particular role, had a particular impact on her life and um, on her career. Um, she and her family had to escape um, uprisings um, in Warsaw, um, but even so, she continued uh, to perform. She gave um, secret concerts all while being a mother, maintaining a family, um, as uh, most of us uh, last summer saw uprisings and uh, other sorts of uh, unrest uh, in relation to the murder of uh, George Floyd. I think it could be sort of hard to imagine as fires burn somewhere underground, there is a, a, a Western classical music concert. Well, you know, in a, in a bigger way, uh, that was the case for Grazina Bacevich Dur during uprisings and um, uncertainties tied to World War II. She really still believed in the power of music and made sure that those performances performances uh, continued to move forward. So one of many, many, many reasons why this woman uh, should be celebrated even beyond uh, being a musician and composer. Grazia Nabachevich shifted to composition officially and exclusively after earning a professorship um, at the State Conservatory of Music in Lutz. So um, after years of performing, um, traveling, hiding, and again, maintaining her family, she finally got uh, one of those highly coveted uh, professorships, which allowed her to um, focus on her uh, composition. And she's hailed as one of Poland's most important women um, in music. Uh, the way that I really think about the idea of support when it comes to Grazina Bacevic, um, really centers around um, that professorship. Uh, we, again, have examples like uh, Tchaikovsky, the individual rich uh, patronage. We have sort of the, uh, the government um, affiliation of uh, Edward Grieg. And then when it comes to uh, Ms. Bacevic, we have to talk about how institutional support really makes way for so many of these pieces of music. Not all composers uh, were teachers, and certainly uh, most of the composers never earned professorships in this way. But um, they're, they're you know, there is a, a very strong argument for the fact that, again, uh, the music of hers that we have today, at least um, post-1940, 45, may not have uh, been available, may not have been created if she didn't have uh, the security um, of an institution really backing her and the art form that she's advocating for. 
Now, it's important to note that while um, Grazina Bacevic is a very important woman in Polish history and Western classical music history, she wasn't the very first woman of music in Poland. One uh, of the women that Graz, uh, Grazina Bacevic really um, admired and, and uh, looked up to um, academically and musically was the then and now late Maria Szymanowska. She was hailed as one of Poland's first piano virtuosi of, um, of any gender, as a matter of fact. So not only um, the first woman of music a composition in Poland, but one of the first individuals of, of Polish performance of music. Uh, she traveled during her day and performed throughout Europe, especially in Russia. And again, when we think about um, her time in Russia, Maria Szymanowska's time in Russia, uh, we can tie that back to, again, the, the codification of that idea of a national sound as led in those days uh, early earlier uh, back then in the um, early 19th century but you know again that idea of writing music that speaks to its people and speaks uh, to its culture when i think about shimanovska uh, traveling and performing throughout russia i imagine that there had to have been a bit of that um, that was exposed to her that she brought back to Poland that would uh, uh, continue to grow and manifest into the uh, many other nationalist Polish composers that we know uh, today, most famously um, Chopin. Szymanowska maintained her own performance salon, a group of uh, musicians uh, with whom she would experiment and write music with and perform with. Uh, she taught music uh, formally, which was uh, still uh, considerably rare, relatively rare in those days for a woman. And she even uh, ended up getting recognition from the royal court. So she really did um, rise the ranks despite all of the challenges that she faced back in those days. Um, Szymanowska is another figure worth celebrating and honoring um, in contemporary settings because of all of these things. And again, she was a huge influence uh, to the music of uh, Ms. Bacevic. So uh, an important name to know when you consider and listen to the music of Grazina Bacevic, the late great Maria Szymanowska. <clears throat> Bacevich's uh, legacy um, has continued to grow and uh, continue to impact uh, the music of Poland, specifically the music of uh, Polish women. Uh, the woman pictured here is uh, a living composer. She's about 84 years old now, a Polish composer by the name of Bernadetta Matuszkak. And I looked up <laughs> that uh, pronunciation and practiced it a lot this morning. Bernadetta Matuszkak. She was quoted as saying, in Poland, Grazina opened the way for women composers. It was difficult for her, but with her great talent, she won. She became famous. Afterwards, we had an open path and no Nobody was surprised. My God, a woman composer again? Bacevich had already been there. So the next one also had a right to exist. Um, Matushkak uh, gave this quote decades, decades ago, I, I believe back in the um, 80s, 80s or 90s. And as we continue to talk about diversity and programming these days, not only racial diversity, but gender diversity, it's so important to note all of these really important women when we really center in on Poland, again, we have Szymanowska, we have uh, Batsevich, we have Matuszkak, and there are so many others. So um, when you're thinking about programming and you're thinking about um, diversity when it comes to even just your listening and who you offer support to, always remember that there are composers of color and women composers who are not only here now, but have always been here, a long legacy that uh, uh, Grazina Bacevich really helps um, keep to the front, uh, both in her day <clears throat> and when it comes to the programming of her music uh, today. Some of the uh, latter accolades by Grazina Bacevich is in 1956, she won the second prize at the International Composition Competition um, with her fifth uh, string quartet. In 1960, um, she won a um, uh, uh, a prize in Paris that continued in 1965, and she uh, received several Lifetime Achievement Awards over her career. So um, while um, her name and her legacy tends to be centered in um, in Poland and, uh, and maybe even in Europe, 
um, she really did have global success that even uh, touched uh, the United States once upon a time. So the piece of music on this program, the piece of music that will begin the August 7th and 8th program um, by Bacevich is her concerto for, screen, uh, for strings. It earned her um, a national prize, um, but it was also performed for the first time in the United States by the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, DC. It was a concert that uh, was met with much uh, critical um, acclaim. I included a, a quote here from um, one of the critics that was in the crowd, he said that there was nothing feminine about Miss Bacevich's piece. It was vigorous, even virile, with in the first movement a pulsing, throbbing rhythm and bold thematic material. It was either conservatively modern or radically classical. In any case, it was worth listening to. I included this quote because, again, when we talk about the, um, the, the unique challenges and struggles that women can composer had and continue to have, it even um, is quite uh, apparent and telling in this, um, in this critique, in, in this review. The review is relatively positive, but uh, with words, with phrases like nothing feminine about it, even describing the first movement as pulsing and throbbing really showcases how that male lens, how that man view even um, was a challenge for women composers in the way that their music was uh, received, in the way that their music was critiqued, even in a, a positive way. But uh, nonetheless, we, uh, continue to make more room as we talk about equitable practices in all ways um, for Ms. Bacevich's uh, work and the work of the many, many, many women of uh, Western classical music days past who played a very uh, important role um, in uh, the art form. Again, with uh, the support that she received from her institutions and the uh, many other um, very famous and uh, large and consequential organizations that gave her these prizes, um, it, it didn't make her name as famous as uh, some of the other, um, uh, some of her other male counterparts in those days. But, you know, thanks to the Lake Area Music Festival and so many others, her name is one that more and more people are becoming uh, familiar with, the late, great Grazina Bacevic. Uh, we're going to actually listen to uh, the first minute and a half or so of, of the opening movement. I believe this is the opening movement of the Concerto for Strings uh, that I chose here. As you're listening, I hope that uh, you'll pay special attention to not only uh, the new uh, sounds that uh, she brought uh, with her compositions, with this 20th century composition, but also the way that she really paid uh, attention and honored not only the larger Western classical tradition, but specifically the, the tradition of Poland. As you listen to these melodies, uh, I want you to imagine some of the folk songs that uh, she may have uh, uh, been listening to, uh, the sounds of, of the earlier century through the music of Maria Szymanowska that she had to have been thinking about when uh, uh, when composing this piece and uh, many other works. So this is a little bit of the Concerto for Strings by Grazina Bacevic. This performance features the NFM Leopoldium Orchestra.
Yeah, I, I can't help but to smile um, as I listen to that and look along uh, with the score there. I, I really love uh, new music, contemporary music, but I think that um, Bacevic masterfully uh, matched both the new, those new sounds, especially uh, in the rhythmic motifs you heard there, with the melodies that you can um, connect your ear to, uh, the really beautiful cello melody that we heard uh, in, in that excerpt. The other thing I would like to point out around, if you were paying attention, around a uh, rehearsal uh, number three in that excerpt, the hemiola you heard, bum, 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 reminds me a lot of um, Beethoven, his, his Ninth Symphony. So as we talk about, you know, these composers um, and the support that they received uh, in their local way, I think it's also fun to think about uh, the broader classical repertoire that we know and uh, that uh, Bacevich also knew and the way that um, in, it impacted um, her music music and, and uh, her compositions and her perspective on composition. So at the end of the day, support is vital. For Tchaikovsky, um, it was vital that he met Nadezhda von Meck um, even uh, just from a distance and receive that, um, that uh, support uh, from her. Um, it's vital that Edward Grieg was viewed by his government as the composer that he wished to be seen as, this nationalist composer who really um, uh, highlighted and celebrated the sounds of his uh, native Norway. And then when we get to Bacevich, um, receiving that professorship, earning those prizes, and even getting uh, premieres in the United States, that sort of support was so vital, again, in an ecosystem, even uh, up into the mid-20th century, that wasn't so friendly to women composers. It was vital. That support was vital for all of this music and um, all of those things to exist. I included um, an image here of another uh, very important uh, woman character, one uh, that you may remember as the Oracle uh, from The Matrix. One, one quote from her uh, that I decided to bring in today is that the path of the one is made by the many. She was, of course, talking about Neo, but I think that we can um, apply that uh, to composers, to musicians, and even to compositions, the path, the survival of all of these things, all of these individual uh, bits of art, all of these stories, all of these people. Uh, it's made possible by each and every one of us, not only by listening and advocating for this music, but really putting our resources forward, just as so many people have before us. The composers are counting on us. The art form itself is counting on us. And the Lakes Area Music Festival is counting on you. Be a part of the tradition of supporting the survival of Western classical music, as we've seen in context of this concert and even beyond by by, uh, making sure that you are offering your financial support in every way you can. We want the Lakes Area Music Festival to be among the many stories as we move forward in history uh, that tells uh, the tale of how impactful um, individual um, and uh, organizational institution, uh, institutional support is and can be to um, Western classical music. So that does it for um, that part, the formal part of the presentation. If you have um, any questions or uh, comments, uh, feel free to uh, put those uh, in the chat here. Um, and um, we can we can discuss those um, as, as folks are thinking of questions or, or maybe if uh, anyone uh, doesn't um, have any questions, I'll uh, remind everyone that information um, on this upcoming concert and all upcoming concerts can be found on the Lakes Area Music Festival. If you would like uh, to invite folks to uh, take a look uh, at this lecture once again, uh, links to those uh, will be available as well. Um, I'll, I'll wait a, a couple minutes here uh, for a, a question or two um, from the audience. Uh, as we're waiting, let's see. Oh, uh, here's a question here. It says, how can people support the Lakes Area Music Festival? Well, I'll do this live. And actually, um, for fun, maybe I will um, share my screen once again. So for folks who don't know, the website is lakesareamusic.org. You go to the website here and you can see information about upcoming events and um, the calendar. But right there at the top, 
you see the button that says support. You can uh, select donate now and you can get other information about ways um, to give. So um, you can you know, choose, your, choose your amount and uh, again, be a part of the long and vast tradition of supporting um, Western classical music uh, with your support. Well, if uh, there are no um, other questions, I would like uh, to thank you once again for uh, checking out uh, this LAMP cast. A huge thanks uh, to everyone at the Lakes Area Music Festival, Taylor, Scott, and uh, Anna for facilitating um, this uh, concert. And um, I hope you enjoy music by uh, Bacevich, Grieg, and Peter Tchaikovsky. Until next time, happy listening uh, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.